All right, with me is John Schriffen, new TV <laughs> voice of the White Sox. Did, did that sound good, how I announced your voice with, with enthusiasm? Man, I love that. Just bring the heat. That's all I asked for. Uh, listening to your broadcast, John, you do tend to bring the heat. I think White Sox fans should know that about you, and they're going to hear that. Where, where does that heat come from? Why do you get so enthusiastic about Collins sports? I get so excited because of the opportunity. I'm a former athlete, and I got hurt and wasn't able to play baseball anymore during college. So anytime I get the opportunity to be in a booth, get the best seat in the house, and get paid to call the game, I'm just so grateful that it's just naturally, I'm just that inner kid comes out. I'm like a fan. I get so excited. I can't really control myself um, because I know now with this baseball opportunity, I'm one of 30 to be able to have this opportunity to call for a team. Um, and even other games, like, it doesn't matter the game for me, really. It could be a high school game. It could be Little League Baseball that I'm calling games, you know? I, I just love the passion that athletes bring. And whatever I can bring to support that in the booth, that's why I get excited. So every broadcaster has their own style. This is your style. Has anyone along the way, did anyone along the way tell you, no, you got to tone that down. Tone it down. Don't be that. Or did you just say, you know what? Green lights the whole way. This is what I'm doing. This is who I am. And no one actually said to you because people have opinions and they might be saying that's not professional. Now I'm on your side, but I'm curious if anybody along the way said, no, you shouldn't do that. For sure. And I've had bosses along the way and I always, I'm always looking for feedback, right? Like we're always trying to get better or no one is ever perfect. And I think the people, the best ones are the ones who realize there's always something you can work on. So I had a boss once told me at ESPN, he said, the best thing you have is that you have all this excitement, you have all this energy and it's easy to tone somebody down, than get somebody and bring somebody up. So the example that he gave to me was when you're broadcasting a game as an announcer, you want to have credibility with the fans. And when a fan is watching a game, for the most part, people aren't exactly tuned in to every single inning, right? Like we have busy lives. We've got kids, you got work, things are going on. You're going to the fridge, you're getting food. There's something else going on. So most of the time the game could be on in the background. So if I make a big call and I grab your attention and I pull you back to the TV it better be for a big play and you better be excited about it because if you come back and it's a routine ground ball and I got all hype and excited about it, you're like, who is this guy? What is he doing? And then you're not going to come back to the TV the next time. So I want to have that credibility. So you have to know how to measure your excitedness and, and know how to be ready for the big moments, but also know when it's just a routine ground ball. And that's all it is. To make a golf analogy, I like to do that at times. It's seven iron, seven iron, five iron, but then you know when to bring out the driver. Is that basically what you're saying? Oh, 100%. Like if you're trying to – or if it's a par five and you're trying to go for the green in two, oh, let's go. Let's get ready. If, if it's like 250 out and we're gearing up and the excitement is there and you got to get everything into it, let's let's be ready for it. I so say touched on it, the opportunity that you got with the White Sox. What does this mean for your career to make this kind of jump and have this kind of job? I mean, this is huge. I mean, this is what all broadcasters, when you're broadcasting sports, this is what you dream of. I mean, because there aren't many jobs out there like this. And to, the exciting part for me is to have access to a team. So let me take a step back, right? So I'm a national broadcaster for ESPN. And what we do, uh, we get our schedule maybe, you know, three weeks, a month out. And we like to watch games. We like to prepare. And we like to read notes and read articles to get ready for the game. Um, but when we fly in, we'll try to go to a practice or two, talk to the coaches, talk to a few players, and we're always in scramble mode. We're always trying to figure out the team to just show the out national audience that we know we're knowledgeable. But at the end of the day, we're still flying in and flying out, and we're just kind of scrambling to try to figure out these teams on the fly. When you get a team job, it is an honor because you have access to the team 24-7, and the fans expect you to be knowledgeable and to have that kind of insider information to really go in depth with the team and really let people know what is going on from spring training all the way to the end of the season. So for my career, this is an opportunity now to show people that I can get to know a team in depth. I can handle a long schedule for baseball. I know how to tell stories. I know how to get Steve Stone involved. I know how to tell if somebody's struggling at the plate to really give an in-depth um description of basically what they could be working on or what's going on with that player um so for my career this is huge i mean this is what i've always dreamed for i always wanted to get to big leagues as a kid 
it didn't happen as a player, but as a broadcaster, man, this is this is the coolest thing ever. Yeah, that kind of happened to me organically because I came started working here in 04 and my first year I was anchoring. I was I even covered the Cubs a little bit. The White Sox, Bulls, Blackhawks, White Sox win the World Series. That kind of got me on this path. But then it wasn't until like five or six years ago where I was exclusively just only covering the White Sox. And I know what that's like. I, as a sportscaster, I wouldn't want to necessarily be a generalist. Some people like to be the generalist. I like this. And I think this is going to suit you very well, too. Yeah. No, I mean, here's the thing. Both have its place and both are great, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I still want to have my opportunities at ESPN. And, and what's great about ESPN is that you get to travel around and explore and find new college towns and new arenas and venues that you've never been to and explore that. But now this is to take it to another level, right? Like the best of the best get the team jobs. There's only 30 people in Major League Baseball. And this is where I can really prove to people what I can bring as a broadcaster. And really what I try to do for the fans is just have fun, right? Like we can't always get to the ballpark. But if you're at home, let me see how I can try to bring the ballpark into you and see how we can all just be a part of this together. So what are you learning about White Sox fans? So White Sox fans, for the most part, have been awesome. Like, I'm talking legit, legit. And I'm not the biggest social media guy, so I'm not always checking, you know, the mentions on Twitter or, I guess, X now and Instagram. But for what I've read and people have been reaching out, everyone has been super cool, super positive. And seriously, like, I cannot thank White Sox fans enough. Because the biggest comment that I've gotten from White Sox fans is, I want to give you a shot. You know, I've seen your stuff on ESPN. I love your energy. I love your passion. You know, I want to give you a chance. I hope you become one of us. And let's be real. Like, I'm not from Chicago. I'm born and raised in New York City. I know what it's like when somebody comes into your city and tries to pretend like, oh, yeah, I'm that guy. But I'm not, right? I want to get to know Chicago. I want to get to know different um, neighborhoods, walk around, try new food, get to know the people. Um, and all I ask is that people give me a chance. And uh, I'm going to show you that I'll be prepared. I'll bring the energy. And we're going to have some fun. You said two things there that will be good for you. You like to eat and you go <laughs> on walks. So because you're going to have to walk off all the food you're going to eat. You're going to have so much fun eating here and walking around the city. Those are two of my favorite things to do in Chicago is eating and burning it all off by walking around. <laughs> oh, no, I can't wait. Well, so I have a dog. He's nine. He's Charlie. Uh, he's like a, a rescue, but he's a boxer mix, so he's super active. So he could go on walks forever. And trust me, when I get to Chicago, we will be exploring. So what was the interview process like? You know, do you, is your agent or do you just apply for the job? Do you hear back? And then how did it go from there, from the beginning stages to they tell you? And how, how did you find out that you got the job? So it was a long, extensive process. And, and to the White Sox credit, they did their due diligence. I mean, they did their homework. They told me they had over 100 applicants for this position that they really combed through. Um, I had my agent reach out. Um, I've always wanted to be in a major city calling for an incredible historic franchise like the White Sox. When I saw the opportunity, I said, this would be perfect. Um, so basically, my agent sent over my tape, my resume reel. Um, I've got Major League Baseball experience. I've been covering Major League Baseball for the last few years for ESPN Radio. So they got to hear some of my radio calls. They got to see my TV work with ESPN, with uh, college baseball, uh, and then also other sports to just show kind of what I bring to different situations. Um, so first it was just seeing my reel. And when they saw my reel, they were interested and they wanted to learn more. So then after that, it was the Zoom interview. Um Zoom interview with the team and the executives and just trying to get to know what my interest was in the job because it was still early on in the process. They knew I have this national platform at ESPN. So they wanted to figure out, OK, how serious are you about this? Because we're interested. What is your level of interest? And then they also let me know that if I was really interested, that they wanted someone who would make a big commitment to the team in the sense of they wanted someone who's going to call the majority of their games. Now, yes, they said up front, like, we'll give you days off and you can eat rest, whatever it may be. And if you have other ESPN games, we'll give you a few days off here or there. But for the most part, whoever gets this White Sox job, this is their main job. And I said, great. <laughs> That's awesome. Sign me up. So we got past that stage. Uh, the next stage was they whittled down the candidates and they, I think they got down to their final three. And they told me they flew all three candidates out to Chicago. So flew me to Chicago, got to the ballpark. It was actually my first time being at the ballpark 
in person. Um, so I sat down with PR, HR, all the staff, NBC Sports Chicago. Uh, there were probably about seven people in the room. Um, and they just wanted to get to know me, who I am as a person. Uh, what's my baseball background? What's my passion? Why um, this job? Why the White Sox? Um, so I explained to them just kind of my background as uh, a former player, right? As a kid, my identity was a baseball player. That was my first love. Um, and I kind of take it back. So being biracial, growing up in the 80s in New York City, I would get looks, right? Like my dad's, my dad's a uh, white guy. He's Polish and Irish. My mom's African-American. So I would get looks and it was early on and people didn't really know what to make of it. And uh, like the, the biggest thing that stood out as a childhood. So when I wanted to get a taxi cab in New York City with my dad, I mean, cabs would just like line up and break their neck to pull over for my dad. But then when I was with my mom who's African-American, I mean, it, we could be standing on the corner for half an hour. And so I felt that as a kid, that something about me was just different. Um, but when I was on the baseball field, I was like everybody else. All anyone cared about was, could you play? How can you contribute? Right? Like I was just one of the guys. So for me, baseball was the first place that I ever felt comfortable in the world. And I've always had that just inner gratefulness for being on the diamond and just being one of the guys and not sticking out and just being regular. Um, so that was just my identity growing up. And so I get to college and I'm explaining the story to, to all the executives and, and I get to college and I had scholarship offers to play D1 baseball. I, I, my first choice, I wanted to go play at Fordham in the Bronx. That was kind of my home field as a travel kid. Um, but I got in academically to go to Dartmouth. And so my mom goes, I don't know what's going to happen with baseball. You could get hurt, but you're going to Dartmouth. You would have an education. So of course, mom knows best, <laughs> right? Uh, like my first week or two, of practice. I mean, I, I think it was my first bullpen. I felt like a little pinch in my right elbow. My throat oh, went no. What? And I had never felt anything like that before. So this coach is behind me, watch me throw a bullpen. And I'm like, okay, I got to try to fight through this. And I remember the next pitch I threw, it was just excruciating and I couldn't do anything. And I got an MRI. It came back negative. I was diagnosed with tendonitis. I'm like, okay, let me just rest. I can, you know, rehab. I'm training with the team. I'm still working. I'm not out. liking where this story is going. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out, as we get closer to actually the start of the season, um, and I tried to throw another bullpen, it just wasn't happening. Like it, it was excruciating to throw the ball. And I went to another doctor, got another opinion, another MRI, and he found the tear. And it turned out I needed Tommy John. Hmm. It was kind of late in my freshman year. Um, before the season was going to start. And if I would gotten Tommy John, I would have been out freshman year, sophomore year, and then try to come back my junior fall. And I'm like, I'm not going pro. I came here to get an education. Like, what am I really doing? So it was that point where I stepped away from baseball. But it was, man, I, I'd tell you, it, it put me in a dark place. Like, I was lost. I started drinking heavily. I was going out. I was just like, I didn't know who I was. Right. Because that was my identity as a person, as a baseball player. And now I have to go find myself and I'm thrown into this new world. And I, at the time, I'm 18 years old. Right. Like, I don't know who I am. Um, so I explained to the White Sox executives in this interview that I had a friend in the booth uh, for radio station who was calling the, the, the games for the baseball games for this, like the student radio station. And he said, look, Shrip, you know, the team, you know, these guys, I, you know, I don't have a co-host like just come in the booth. You can be my analyst for an inning. If you hate it, you can bounce. Who cares? I said, sure. I mean, I, I got nothing better to do. Let's do this. Um, I got in the booth, and I'm telling you, it was like the closest thing to ever playing. I felt that rush, that just, you know, that happy place you get to. I, and most people never have this, but the, if you get to that happy place where nothing else in the world matters, all of your problems, everything goes away, time just seems to stop. That's what broadcasting was for me. And, and I explained to the White Sox that broadcasting for me is not a job. It's my life. It's my passion. It's what saved me. And I'm so grateful to even be in this room in front of you. And if I get this opportunity, I'm not going to let you down. Um, and I guess that story played a part in it because that's, I mean, that's who I am, right? Like that just sums up what baseball means to me. Yeah, it says a lot about who you are, what is beating inside your heart inside your body and what the sport does for you 
and what the job does for you. I get it too. When I do this podcast, when I'm on the set, when I'm working, it doesn't feel like a job. It feels like my life and time does slip away. Not slip away, just it goes away. It washes away because I'm so into what I'm doing. And that, that's such a great story. So much was in there, what you said. Uh, How did you find out you got the job? Uh, okay, so we're getting down to it. I met with everybody at, at the White Sox, flew back home here to Las Vegas, and it was still down to the final three. And then it, it got out in the local newspaper who the three candidates were. So now everybody knows I'm going up for this job along with two other like really qualified candidates, guys who like I'm sure would have done a great job as well with this position. Um, and the team said, you know, we still have a few more interviews that we want you to go with, to. Do you have the availability to fly to Phoenix, meet with Jerry Reinsdorf, and then if that goes well, meet with Steve Stone, who could be your potential partner? I said, yeah, of course. <laughs> Meeting with Jerry, Jerry Reinsdorf and was Steve. the gatekeeper. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'll, I will make sure that I have the availability. So I got on a plane. I flew out to Phoenix in the morning. I met Jerry. Um, and Jerry is – Jerry's literally – I know people have an impression of what billionaires are, but Jerry is one of the most down to earth, just, just good people. His, he's funny. I mean, he was cracking jokes. He's his passion for baseball comes across his knowledge of the game. And also just like how sharp his mind is. We talked about so many just historical moments in baseball that he could just vividly remember. I mean, he was in a stadium at Ebbets field, for the Dodgers in Brooklyn when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. And that was one of my first questions to him. I said, what, what did you remember about that day? And, and what was cool to hear from him was it wasn't so much Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier. It was who Jackie Robinson was as a baseball player. That's what stood out for Jerry, just how fast he was, how hard he would run. I mean, Jerry talked about um, Jackie Robinson turning the bag at first after a single to right field and staring at the right fielder. And if the right fielder wasn't ready for it and he would try to throw in behind him, Jackie would go to second. Or if he made that wide turn and the throw came in front, he would come back. So to hear Jerry talk about Jackie Robinson as the baseball player and not as the man breaking the color barrier and just his game, that meant a lot to me. Um, so I guess I passed that round of interview. Right, right, um, right. So he then brought you to the promised land, meeting the one and only Steve Stone. Meeting the Wizard of Oz, Steve Stone. <laughs> I mean, and Steve Stone, everyone loves Steve, right? Like, Steve is the greatest guy ever. He's been around the game forever. He's got all the best stories. Um, but I didn't know what to expect, right? When you meet somebody for the first time, you don't know how you're going to hit it off with the person. You don't know how you're going to connect. You see them on TV, and you think you have an idea of who they are. Um, but when I met Steve in person, he is exactly – what you see on TV, I mean, the nice guy with the great passion, the stories, the energy, just the friendly nature of who he is, what you see on TV, that's Steve Stone. So we sat down for dinner and it was only supposed to be like an hour dinner plan. Yeah, yeah. Steve Stone does not have our dinners. That's just, <laughs> this is not going to happen. He has too much to say, too much to talk about. And we talk about broadcasting, forget about it. That's at least two hours. Right. Well, it turned into three. I mean, it was a three-hour dinner with Steve, and we actually had to cut it off because I had to get the flight back to Vegas because <laughs> I was only supposed to be there for the day. But it was – I mean, it literally felt like a magical day, right? Like I had to pinch myself on the flight back home to Vegas. Like, did this really just happen? Did I just meet the owner of the White Sox? Did I just meet Steve Stone, the man who had 25 wins in a season? And, and yeah, I definitely asked him about 1980. Like, I wanted to know what happened that season, what clicked, what was magical for him. He basically um, threw pitches – they would end his career, but give him a Cy Young award. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Isn't that yeah, wild? But that's who he is. is. Yeah, yeah. That's who he is as a person and just his process. He told me he had to fix his mental makeup, right? Like he had to dig into his subconscious to tell himself and really believe that he was one of the best players in baseball. And he said, he goes, even if I'm facing a Hall of Famer, who I know at the plate is going to be a surefire Hall of Famer, he said, on this day, I'm going to be the better player. And that was the mentality he had for 1980, which is so cool. All right. So next time you see him, now this will be like a 10 hour conversation. Ask him about all the broadcasters who he has worked with. Starts with, yeah, going backwards, Jason Minetti, Hawk Harrelson, Harry Carey, Al Michaels, Pat Summerall, Bob Costas, Bill Murray, Bill Murray, Ronald Reagan. 
<laughs> I mean, because of the Cubs thing and ABC, all these people entered his orbit. He's like the Forrest Gump of broadcasting. He's been able to work with so many great people. And now you're a part of that. That's got to feel amazing. I mean, it, I'm telling you, it's surreal. I know it was announced, what, like a week ago now? It has not sunk in. It, it really hasn't. I mean, this is a dream job. To think about all the legendary broadcasters who have had this position before. And also the responsibility that comes with this, right? Like, I mean, the fan base for the Chicago White Sox, Southside, it's legit. I mean, diehard fans who gets passed down from generation to generation. And I don't want to feel like I was just given this job and I'm just like going to be the guy. I'm going to work hard, right? Like I come from a working class family. My book, my parents were both teachers growing up. I know what it means to grind and to ha and like not be given something. I want to earn the respect of the fans. I want to put in the time in spring training. I want to get to know the team. And I want to show the fans that I'm as passionate, if not more, than anybody else out there because that's how much this job means to me. Awesome. Well, it's been great talking with you. I uh, learned a lot about you, and I'm sure White Sox fans did as well. And uh, the spring training is right around the corner, opening day, essentially, right around the corner. We need, we need that, actually, just to say, hey, you know, it's going to get warm eventually in Chicago. <laughs> um, and uh, looking forward to uh, – uh, your career with the White Sox, calling games with Steve Stone, and uh, we are compadres now because I work for NBC Sports Chicago, so we'll be working together uh, as well. I look forward to this, this relationship. No, thanks for having me on. Looking forward to the, talking to you soon. Okay. And that is a wrap for this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast, brought to you by Wintrust, your home for White Sox checking with free ATMs nationwide. Go to their special White Sox webpage, www.wintrust.com slash Sox, one of your former – by play announcers. Hawk Harrelson, take it away. Thanks, our Chuck. And this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast is over. Congrats, you finished the video. If you want to build on that success, download the NBC Sports Chicago app. It's got highlights, exclusive insights, and push alerts tailored to you. Everything you need to be a real Chicago sports fan. Download it now.